can get started. It's, uh, it's four o'clock by my watch. And like I said earlier, before some of you guys got here, I'm the only, only thing that stands between you guys and beer. And although I don't drink, I'm not one to stand between someone else and their beer. So who in the room knows me already? Knows who I am at least? Okay, good, good. I'm doing my job as, as promoting myself and personal branding and all that. So the session today is recreate moth-based DSC resources as class-based DSC resources. And so this is kind of a story. It's a lot different than Jeff's session this morning if you were there. Uh, there's really no theoretical stuff in this session. This is all what I've done and why I did it and that sort of stuff. And I certainly don't consider myself to be a DSC expert. Uh, but I had a, a story to share and I wanted to come share it. And although I write PowerShell code every day, I don't work with DSC every single day. So I just want to let you guys know that up front. So if you have any questions that I can't answer, I'll be happy to get you an answer. But I'm not going to fumble through some, answer, some question that I don't know the answer for. So a little, I'll go through this really quick. Most of you guys know who I am. Mike F. Robbins. I'm a Microsoft MVP on PowerShell. And actually now I'm a Cloud and Data Center MVP because we got rolled up into that group. But I'm a, uh, I am also run the Mississippi PowerShell user group. I've co-authored or authored a number of PowerShell books. I was the winner of the advanced category in the 2013 scripting games. You can learn more about me at MikeFRobbins.com. I've got may way more slides than I normally have. We're not going through those slides. We're going to go through the demo because I told somebody else who was presenting here what I was doing and he said, you're going to do that in 45 minutes? So we're going to do all the code and if we have time, we'll come back to the slides because I don't think anybody wants to see a lot of slides. The one thing I want to show you is this slide. This is what's in the synopsis or abstract for the session because the summit is about you guys. So I just want to make sure that you're in the right session. And we'll go ahead and get started. Let's see what the, I'm not going to ask you guys these questions. I think you, uh, you, know, what, you know what session you're in and that's the main thing. So we're going to jump to a VM. I'll tell you a little bit about the demo environment. So we've got a, a Windows 10 VM. I am going to present in the IC, although I've been using VS Code pretty much all the time for the last year. I've seen too, mu too many presenters have issues with it this year. And also, I've been using the IC for eight, year eight or more years since PowerShell 2. So I just feel a lot more comfortable in the IC. To me, it's more bulletproof to stand in front of a group of people and present with. So the way this session came about, and there is one slide I do want to show you. So we'll jump back and forth here a little bit. So this is, Microsoft had a, a DSC resource for configuring a remote desktop. And I'm going to use it as an example. And the example I'm going to create as a moth and class-based resource is for disabling or for RDP, but specifically I want to disable RDP because I want my admins either to put the uh, GUI tools on their desktop or manage boxes remotely with PowerShell. I don't want them going into it with RDP. And this is a simple resource because a lot of times you get into so much complexity in, in a topic that you can't see the forest for the trees. So the less code I can show you to accomplish the process, the, the easier it will be to understand. And I've got some arrows in this code. This is Microsoft's code. Does anybody know what's wrong with this code? And it's kind of hard to see, but the problem is, is when they get down, let's see. So what they're doing is they have insure as a string. And when they get here, they get, say get insure and you can't see all of it. So it's a little bit difficult, but this, this ends up being an integer. And this also ends up being an integer. They, they actually end up because of these switch statements. See this one, they're saying user authentication and they use user authentication again. But they made a mistake and they used ensure and this uh, deny TS connections here. So the problem is once they get down to this if statement, they're comparing a string to a numeric value so it's always true. So if 
they designed this so it would have an if statement and they would only set, there's two settings for RDP. One is to turn it on and one is to set a network level authentication so it's more secure. And the way they designed this is they wanted it only to set the one that was wrong if, if the uh, test DSC configuration failed. Well, the way it's written, this one part of it, this one if statement's always gonna run regardless if that one needs to be set or not. It doesn't hurt anything and that's why nobody ever noticed it. But to me, it's just irritating to have code that doesn't work the way it was designed to work. So initially, back in 2014 is when I found this problem, and that's when I designed a DSC resource, a MOF-based resource. Okay. So I'm going to show you how we did MOF-based resources in 2014 and how we're doing class-based resources today with a lot of the different naming. All my code, and I will go back one more time, and then hopefully this will be it. All my code's already available on GitHub. I've actually been living dangerous today. I like doing things that Don Jones tells me not to do. So he, tell, he told me not to do Windows updates for my, before my session yesterday, so I did Windows updates. And I even ran Git Hotfix to show everybody I ran Windows updates. Well, today I've been updating my demo in every session I sat in, and I've committed it to GitHub so you can see the differences. Uh, and that was the other thing he told me not to do. Never update your code at the last minute, you know. So, uh, so we'll see how this demo goes. So what I've done, I've already ran the presentation prep. I've zoomed in to 175%. I've actually, uh, I saw a tip from Michael Bender about people with color blindness. And I typically set my errors to green, but he said set them to yellow, so I've already done that. And j just this little simple script here. And just in case I run the entire demo, I've got a throw statement. And you can see I, I stole or borrowed this code from Thomas Rayner. If you are going to borrow somebody else's code, just give them credit for it. So I used to use break at the top of my scripts, but break doesn't always break because it's designed to break out of a loop and not break out of a script. So I've had some scenarios where it did not work, but throw always works. OK, so the demo environment, we've got a Windows 10 machine with version 1709. It's got PowerShell 5.1 on it. It's actually got PowerShell Core, but we're not going to use it in this session because DSC does not work with PowerShell Core today because the current implementation of of the commandlets in the PS desired state configuration module rely on WMI. And if you've sat through any of the DSC sessions or you're familiar with desired state configuration, then you probably already know that. But I know that Microsoft is working on a new implementation of it. Uh, we have a server named Server01 and a domain controller, and they're running Server 2016. So we're going to create a MOF-based DSC resource. First, you would need to download and install the, the easiest way is to download and install the XDSC resource designer. I've got that line commented out to make sure I didn't run it, but I'm just going to run git to show you that, uh, git module to show you that I've already installed it, and that is the latest version. So and I've got one note here. So uh, install module, if you have a machine that still has PowerShell 4 on it, it doesn't e it doesn't exist because it's part of PowerShell Git, but you can install PowerShell Git on PowerShell version three or higher. Although this demo would, this portion of the demo would require PowerShell four. A lot of times people don't tell you all the details because they've made, they don't have a clean environment. Uh, so they made changes to their machine. And I want to show you the, so the default execution policy we all know on machines is restricted. So if you start down the path, hey, I need to create a DSC resource property, and you've got a brand new machine and you run this, well, guess what? It doesn't work. And it tells you, it, it tells you here, it says run import module. So run, import the module to find what's going on with this. And when you import the module, you actually find out that it can't be loaded because scripts is disabled on the system. So you need to have your execution policy set something other than it needs to be remote signed or, or what I consider to be less. If it's set to restricted or all signed, this, these commandlets won't work. And this is on the machine that you're developing the, uh, the, the DSC resources on, on your workstation. So anyway, we'll just go ahead and set that. I've got, 
what I try to do when I blog and also when I teach things is show the little, the little caveats that if you went and read an article on Microsoft that they wouldn't tell you this. I've got some information in this, so we need to uh, define at least one key property. We're also going to have a write property, but it's optional. So we're going to create a couple of properties with a new XDSC resource property commandlet. The only reason I use splatting here is originally I had the commands as one-liners, but it was so long it was off the screen, and I hate using the backtick character for line continuation, and I also wanted you guys to see the entire command. So let's go ahead and design. Uh, create those those properties and we'll run the uh, the new we'll actually create them at this point those are all the details about those properties and this actually creates them so we'll create now we'll create the the DSC resource based off of those properties and it did not work That's what I, thank you. So it wasn't my uh, updating before. Who said that, you? See me after this. <laughs> okay, so you can also accomplish this with a one-liner, not recommended, because who really wants to troubleshoot this? Because if I did forget to run something, then yeah, good luck telling me what I did wrong. Uh, and I've got that in here. Now, you get a little bit different behavior, so I didn't use the module name parameter when I created that. If you use the, I was trying to figure out why is it different on the Microsoft documentation than when I run it. So if you don't use the module name parameter, it doesn't create a manifest automatically for you. Um, and I guess that's because if you don't use the module name parameter, it's, it looks like it's really designed to be part of another module. So let's just look at the, uh, the directory structure on that. So this is kind of what it looks like. So it's under the Windows PowerShell modules. And notice I have a C in front of it. So back in like 2014, 2015 time frame, it was recommended to put a C in front of your, your uh, modules for DSC resources to say it was for a community. But this was before Microsoft was open sourced all their stuff and they had it all on GitHub and so on. Well, today we're actually, that has changed. And in 2015, you saw, started seeing some blog articles from Steve Murawski that said, hey, let's quit using C. And I know there's also some newer blog articles on the PowerShell team blog that, that uh, has some other recommendations and guidelines. So the PowerShell team art, uh, blog is a good place to find that. Anyway, let's jump out of this. Kind of the moral of the story with that, the, the naming, is just name it something sensible. And I've heard Microsoft say that they may even get rid of the X in front of theirs, and X meant experimental. I know most of theirs still have that. So what we're gonna do now, we'll just create a manifest real quick, just like any other uh, script module. I'm not gonna open up the manifest because there's nothing there special. If you've seen one man manifest, you've seen them all, at least for PowerShell version four. There is something special on the version five one. Uh, so now that I ran that, let's just open up the file. So you've got three functions. It gives you some template code. You can see you've got a, these are the three required functions. You've got get target resource. It's got to return a hash table. You've got a set target resource and it should return nothing, just null. And you've got a, a te test target resource, and it has to return a Boolean, a true or false. And what happens when you, uh, when you set, when you actually set the configuration, it runs test target resource. And if it, if it fails, if it returns false, then it runs set at that point. And if you run get, if you, if you get the DSC configuration, then it runs get target resource. And I'm gonna show you that here in just a second. So it also creates a schema moth. So here's what the schema moth looks like. So the real benefit that I found of using class-based resources is you get rid of the schema moth. And back before they had the, the resource designer toolkit, 
it was really difficult to go back. You know, who, who creates something right the first time? Not me. Uh, so if I, wanted, if I had a lot of code and I had a lot of time invested, I would almost have to delete it and start over and then do a lot of copying and pasting. Now they've, they've got some uh, update commands in the, in the uh, DSC resource kit d designer. It's called something like that. So anyway, what we need to do, we actually write, need to write the code. And since I don't like to type in demos and this is a lot of code to type, I'm actually going to inject the code into the uh, script module. So we'll open it up now. So this is what it looks like now. So I've got all the proper code in there to do exactly what I want to do. And you could do this really with a couple of lines of PowerShell if you ran invoke command, but I don't want to have to uh, run invoke command. I want to do it with DSC. So I've written all the code for this and it does the template puts export module member in there, so it only exports the three required functions. When I get to classes, I'm going to show you there's a better, better way to do some of this because some of the same code is in this file. So if you look at it, test target resource has actually got a lot of the same code as set target resource because I'm testing it in test target resource, but then I'm testing each one, each each of the two items again and set to only set the ones that are out of compliance. Okay, what I'm going to do is really complicated. I'm going to deploy this, uh, this module to my server and instead of setting up a full server or anything like that, hey, I'm just going to copy it. That's what I'm getting at. It's actually really simple what I'm going to do because that's not what this, uh, this demo is about. So we're going to create a simple configuration. By the way, who was in my uh, session yesterday morning? Good, you actually came back. I have a mouse today. I was fighting a, the uh, touchpad yesterday. So we'll create the moth for the configuration and we'll apply it. And what I want to show you this is really small, and my, um, I don't know if you can see it, but, oh, it's not that small. So remote desktop is enabled on there. Yeah, enabled, more secure clients. So I'm just gonna hit enter to, and now it's disabled, because when I, when I applied that configuration, it disabled it, so it worked. So that's a moth-based resource. With MothBase resources, so you've got to have PowerShell 4 on the machine you're applying it to, and the, the module you created has to exist on that machine, and that's why I copied it to it. Now with PowerShell 5, you can do MothBase resources or class-based resources. Okay, so that, that is actually part one of this. And what I'm going to do, so this is the cleanup from that demo. So I'm deleting everything we just did. So that way I have a clean environment. I'm even setting uh, RDP back to the way it was. So now it's enabled. I've deleted everything we created in the demo folder, the module, the whole nine yards to make sure that we're not polluting our environment for the next demo, although I use different names anyway. There's three parts to this demo. The third part is only uh, optimization, it's refactoring, so if we don't get to the third part, it's fine. With, uh, with class-based resources, there's no designer. There's no like command that you can call that I'm aware of at least, unless somebody in the community has written one that will create everything for you. And of course, so we need to create a module and there's no commandlets for creating modules either. Now, one note I had in here is considering doing this with Plaster in the future because I am doing my script modules now with Plaster. And who was in the Plaster session prior to this? Okay. It's something, I'm a newbie to Plaster, but what I have done is taken some of the same things I was do. I had created functions to create like, 
functions to create functions and functions to create script modules, I replicated that in Plaster at this point. Okay, so I, what I've done, I've just run a new item and I've created the, uh, the script module. And notice what, I called it Mr. Remote Desktop. I use Mr. for all my stuff because my initials are MR. I am going to inject the code into that as well. And then we'll open it up and look at it instead of opening it up on the screen. So what I've done, I've defined an enumeration at the top. And then I'm actually using that enumeration as like a, a type of parameter validation. And what I did with this one, so notice that get is really short and even set. So I've broken, I've created, a, I've created other methods besides the three default ones. One thing I do want you to notice on this, and I'm gonna set it so you can see them. So that you still have get, set, and test, but now you have methods instead of functions. And the way this came about, so two years ago at the MVP Summit, I told Microsoft, I said, hey, I know how to create moth-based resources. I don't know how to create class-based resources. And what I wish somebody would do is create a moth-based one and recreate the same one in a class-based one. And they said, well, we think we already have that, and that's the last I heard about it, and yeah, you can't find it on their website, but Anyway, so I said, fine, I'll just go figure it out for myself. And when I figured it out, I said, I actually have blog articles on how to do this. And then I said, I'm going to submit it as a session to share this with other people. Because to me, that's kind of how I learn is by example. And I can go look at the code here and look at the code here and see what the differences are. So what I've done, I'll, I'll show you that get calls get off setting and get ts setting. So those are diff different methods. So what I've done with this is I've eliminated the, the code redundancy. I went a little bit too far and I'll show you that in example three because some of these aren't called by more than one so there's real, really no reason to break those out more. To me if you break them out just to have it into a separate function it's kind of like one of those Russian dolls that you have to drill down into and it makes things a lot more complicated for no reason at all. So we still need a manifest, so we'll create a manifest. Okay, we're gonna, a really complicated deploy mechanism at this point, we'll deploy it. We'll create another configuration and I used a different name. And we're gonna apply it. We'll jump back to our server. And I could have queried the settings, but to show you that it's a one or zero wouldn't have been as effective. So it's enabled here and now it's disabled. So the class-based resource did work. And this is fairly simple code. And that's why I chose this because there's only two registry keys that I'm modifying with this. So it's not like something that's super complicated. But what I found, so a lot of people, they, and I know I'm guilty of this, you see things on the internet and it's like super complicated. But what I try to do is break things down into smaller, more manageable steps so that I take like baby steps to learning this stuff, you know, and it doesn't seem like it's such a steep learning curve. So that was part two. So we'll jump into part three and it looks like we're good on time. I ran, or I didn't have as much time as I needed on yesterday. I guess it was yesterday morning. So I want to make sure we get through the demo because that's the most important part of this. Now one thing with classes in PowerShell, so I was recreating the class in PowerShell and I was searching the internet and I was like, how do I unload a class in PowerShell once I load it? Well, the answer is, because I couldn't find the answer on the internet. And, I was, and today I was like, hey, I've got a whole room full of experts here. So I asked the entire room and it was like, well, you don't. You, uh, you close PowerShell is how you get rid of it. 
And then earlier, uh, I met Jeffrey Snover when he was walking out, and I even hit him up, and he confirmed that, that, yeah, you don't unload them. You close PowerShell. So what I did, and my, you can redefine them, and that works fine. But the problem is, when you have the code in, in the ISC at least, it gives you squiggly lines saying that it's already defined even though you can run the code and it'll update it. And for my demo, I didn't want the squiggly lines, so I just named it something different to make it easy. So let's, uh, let's run this class here. Now my original code had a couple of enumerations which I've removed to simplify the, the code. And there's a couple different ways to instantiate a uh, class in PowerShell. So you can see that's one way, this is another one, and this was another way that I found. And classes to me, I mean, I'm an IT pro, so they seem very foreign. Well, I'm gonna remove the switch statements to show that, so I was using switch statements in the previous code, and I know you didn't see that because I collapsed it. But there, there are switch statements in here that's actually translating the, uh, and I know they're in here. I know I'm overlooking them. There it is, yeah, thank you. So I'm using a switch statement to translate the numeric value to a, to the string value. There's a more efficient way to do that, since I had the enumerations defined anyway. I'm gonna redefine the, the class and, and see, I would say I'm thinking about beer since I said glass instead of class, but uh, since I don't drink. So I redefined it, now I'll just instantiate another copy of the class, and notice that's what you would get without the switch statement. You would get ones. So I'm gonna define the enumeration. I will show you this code, but I wanna make it easier for me to run it. Because scrolling with this is not the easiest thing. And let's show the results of that and then we'll show the code. So that's what we want. So what I've done, I've actually uh, used the enumeration once you get down to, into the code and it doesn't require the switch statement anymore. It simplified the code and I had to have the enumeration anyway. And I've got a lot of details in this. Now one thing I did find with the enumeration, so by default if you do, the, if it kind of implicitly converts the values, so the top value would be zero and the next one would be one, and I'm like, well, that's, I want it to be explicit. I wanna make sure that this string value lines up with this other one no matter what the order is. So what I did is I, I defined it like the second one here. So I gave it a numeric value. So I could say at, put apps at first in, al alphanumeric or in alphabetical order, but have it assigned to one instead of having to have it in a different order than, than in a uh, alphabet order. So the code now, so it was already simple, but after refactoring it, it's even simpler and there's less of it. And to me, any time, now I'm not gonna write PowerShell one-liners because there is a certain way that you can write your code and you have less of it, but it's more complicated. But if I can get less code and make it simpler, then that's the best of both worlds. And instead of showing you that portion of the code here, let's just open it in another window. So what I've done, I've defined those enumerations with the numbers just like I showed you. And I'm using those, so there's no switch statements in there now. Now one thing with the class-based resources or with classes in general in PowerShell is you do have to use the return statement. Because yesterday I was kind of saying that was the, uh, one of the most overused keywords in PowerShell that you typically don't need unless you know exactly what you're doing with it. So let's go ahead and redeploy this one. And apply it. Well, before we apply it, let's see. I 
I would rather set it back to... Uh... So right now it's absent. Because I was using the same configuration on this. So let's, let's enable it. Oh, we didn't recreate the mob. This is, yeah, we, we were on number three. Let's go see if it worked. So now it's disabled, and now it's enabled. So that code worked as well. And I do have a lot of details in this. Uh, I want to jump back to the slide deck at this point because I have some points I wanted to make in the slide deck. Do we have any questions on the demo at this point before I go back to the slides? In your, uh, your test uh, resource, you said if condition is true, then return true, else return false. Could you just in one line say return condition? Uh, I think you could, but I know I've had instances where I thought I could do something and then I tested it and it didn't work. So yes, I think you can, but I'm not 100% sure. Does it take into account present absence? If your insurer is absent, can it exist? It depends what you're trying to set it to. Do you often want to make sure you're returning the correct value if you're trying to set or remove value? Yeah, so you're so you're you're actually calling two other methods. Yeah, I believe so. And what I did, I actually put some of the code back in. So if you see set, set's actually got some of the code back in it. Uh, because that code is only used one time, because you're not gonna set it with the other code. But the code for test and get are very similar. So in my other session, I have a couple words I'm bad about saying, and so was one of them. And I, I, had, a, I had something I gave everybody that called me out on saying that. And too bad, I, don't, too, I gave them all away. I said it so many times. Uh, I was looking at this to see, so test, test auth and test TS setting, I wanted to see if that was called and get. So it's get auth and get TS setting. Oh, the test is called from set. I want to go back to the slide deck. There's a couple of things on there, and I did. I also hit Jeffrey Snover up about something else when I walk, when he uh, was walking out of here. We've covered that. We're not covering the questions for the audience. Let's just jump into this slide. I was concerned about running out of time, but it looks like we've got plenty of time. Uh, so the requirements for a MOF-based resource, of course, as I already said, is Windows PowerShell 4 or higher, and class-based resources is Windows PowerShell 5 or higher. And notice I said Windows PowerShell. So uh, I'm bad about saying, or for years I have said PowerShell, but I think, and I think all of us have probably done that, but now we have to be more specific because we have PowerShell Core. And if they change the name of PowerShell Core to PowerShell, it's even gonna be more confusing, especially if somebody's looking for help on the internet and they go search for PowerShell. <laughs> okay, so uh, the PS desired state configuration module, it requires WMI, and I, I've already mentioned that. But that's the reason it doesn't work on PowerShell Core is because you don't have WMI on PowerShell Core. Um, yeah, and DSC does not like PowerShell Core. I tried to put these in like syntax of PowerShell. It doesn't like PowerShell Core on Windows. Now, I cannot speak for Linux or Mac OS, but I assume that they don't work. it doesn't work on those either. Thank you for confirming that. Okay, so the PowerShell team blog is a good place to look. And 
Michael Green, in a session I attended earlier today, he mentioned uh, be on the lookout for something else coming down the pipe on that blog about DSC, so I would, I would definitely uh, keep your eyes out for that. So, and I mentioned, you know, the way this came about is because Microsoft messed up the uh, X remote desktop admin resource, the set target resource, and it compared a string to an integer. And this was all the details about that. So uh, it was line 89 is, is where the problem was. And this, this was back in the dark ages of DSC. So today, an example is like the SQL Server DSC resource. They were using, uh, they were using contains, a contains method. So it was case sensitive. So I had a problem when I was trying to use DSC for a SQL Server back in the PowerShell 4 days. And what I did, I actually, I was able to uh, fork the repository and simply change them from using a method to using the, uh, the operator. Is it an operator? Okay, get my terms confused here. But anyway, so you can use the, uh, yeah, the contains operator, and this is, all the .NET methods are case sensitive. So if you're, uh, if you're doing like replace with a .NET method, then it's gonna be case sensitive. So the only thing I did, it was a one line fix. It was like just a couple of words I had to cut and paste or type in. And then I was able to uh, do a pull request and they accepted it and everybody had the fix. So that's kind of the best of all worlds. And that's one of the reasons we don't put a C in front of the, our modules anymore is before they didn't have a way to take our code in. And I think some of that, I have no idea what, you know, what, why, but they didn't have it somewhere where they could accept it, I guess, like on GitHub. So it's like Microsoft would have their broken RDP resource forever, and then you would write one to fix their problem, but then nobody would know about yours. And that predated the PowerShell gallery and all that sort of stuff. So at least you have a place to deploy it now and they can also accept our code. And we've already covered that one. Um, so I demonstrated the process. We wrote a custom DSC resource for RDP, and I showed you kind of how it was done in 2014. And the requirements, we, I showed you that already. And kind of the, well, the introduction of DSC was, was, was with PowerShell 4. So prior to PowerShell 4, and all you guys probably know this, you couldn't do DSC at all. And PowerShell 4 was limited to the moth-based resources. We did the demo already. So the naming scheme back in 2014, you had the C prefix that stood for community. You had X that stood for experimental and it was for Microsoft only. In 2015, you started seeing things like let's stop using C now by Steve Murawski. I've got links in the slide deck. In 2017, you started seeing things on the PowerShell team blog about DSC naming guidelines. So I've also already mentioned the required functions and this is showing the PowerShell version four way where you've got get target resource with, that's gotta return a hash table, set target resource has gotta, set target resource only runs if test target resource fails. And it's, you have to design it to configure the non-compliant items and it needs to return just a null. So the test target resource, it determines if the items are compliant and it needs to return a Boolean. And possible improvements, uh, which I did show you, was you can use private functions to reduce the redundancy of your code. It helps you eliminate redundancy. You either need to use export module member to only export the, uh, the target resource functions or you can use functions to export in the module manifest. So the requirement, so I, I showed you part two already, and class-based resources, PowerShell 5 and higher, um, it's got three required methods, and the benefits to me was no moth. So I showed you the refactoring where I used enumerations, and kind of the challenges with classes I've had some issues with debugging, and that's the thing I hit Jeffrey Snover up about. He said that yes, debugging was horrendous in PowerShell 5, but in 5.1 that supposedly it works, although I have not confirmed that yet. But I, 
So that's, that's my alarm. There's no reason to panic. Uh, my alarm let me know that in five minutes somebody's going to open those doors just so I could wrap it up. Uh, I've talked to several different people who are using DSC at this conference. And they said, yeah, the they don't like the debugging and with class-based resources. That the way that they debug it is put a lot of verbose statements in and have that output the uh, information. Versioning, I've also heard a lot about versioning problems. So if you have the module, if you have two different versions of the module on the remote machine, then it'll just give you an error. It won't use the newest version automatically. Um, so I think that is kind of an issue as well. Although I did hear one person say that was fixed. So I have not confirmed that. Great. So it sounds like 5.1 fixed debugging. So based on what I'm hearing, my opinion would be don't do classes in 5 unless you're able to put 5.1 on the box. And testing. I've heard that testing classes is difficult. So I've got some resources here. Um, there's several books I've got on here. There's actually, so the one that, that uh, Don Jones co-authored is on the bottom there. There's links to these. The second one from the last is a new version. I know the first version of this book by Packet, Dave Wyatt, um, did the tech edit on it. And there's a new version of that coming out, but I'm not sure if Dave is involved in that one. And I also know that the third one from the bottom, there's a new version of that one coming out as well. So just check into that. Um, and I've got my last slide here in a second. That's my last slide. So my blog, I blog a lot, mikefrobbins.com. You can find me on Twitter pretty much anywhere with that. If you want my email address, it's encoded on my about page. So go decode it with PowerShell. Those are the books that I've taken part in. Just uh, out of curiosity, who, who's using DSC today? And who is using version 5? Or, well, let me restate that question. Who is using classes? Okay, that's what I meant. Okay. Well, uh, we're about three minutes early, so if I, do I have any more questions? We do have a, at least one expert in the room, I know for a fact, that you work for AWS, right? And I'm drawing a blank at your name, but Andrew. Andrew. Go ahead. So I asked this question earlier, but more I'm going to ask it again. You might have a better answer. So. <laughs> sure. Why? <laughs> well, I wish I used one. Should I use one in a different case? Is there cases where one's better than the other? Should I think about going forward, moving the classes? Should I stay away from it? We talked about this in Jeff Hicks' session this morning, and I was there. But I would like I to get. Too, I would like to get your opinion. Do you have a requirement for Powershell 4 in the first thing? For example, when you're running an older version of Exchange that you can't update? Well, if that's the case, then you don't have an option, right? You need to not base it. Do you want to maintain a model? Is probably my question. I definitely don't. Um, classes are far more structured. You write three methods and you're done. Um, and I don't have to maintain a model. So, I maintain a model in the consensus. Yeah. The third person said that's the key element there. Yeah, and that's that's the one thing that I. Parameters you want, you need to update the model. And the parameters in the model don't necessarily line up with what you need in the functions. So you have a parameter in your model, you don't actually have to have that parameter in the test method, for example. So now you update the model, where do you update it in the functions? The class is one slot. you recommend from here forward, so if I can, go to the class base? Pre-PowerShell 5 release, we were using classes. Because that was simpler to write. Hey, and that, I, uh, the, the MOF is the one thing that we talked about this morning as well, for everybody who wasn't in that session. I think that was kind of the tiebreaker and the dependency of whether you still, still have PowerShell version 4 in your environment. Because 
if you're developing class-based DSC resources, you have to have PowerShell 5 or higher on your machine and on all the target systems. But luckily, like me, I've got PowerShell 5.1 on every one of my systems now, except my Exchange server. And I've got it in hybrid mode, and I'm currently moving to Office 365, so I'm like, don't touch it. We're going to turn it off. We're not upgrading PowerShell on it. Okay, well, thank you guys for attending my session.